is a book. Um, if you have prayer you want, this isn't a prayer request book, but this is so we can pray over the people because God knows what everybody needs. Uh, we ask that you put your name in this prayer, I mean in this book. And if uh, you want to mail it in to us, the address will be on the screen or it's on our website or it's on our Facebook page. Mail it in. Pastor Woody will send you one of these decals here that says Pastor Woody is praying for me. Um, we want everybody, we want to see cars all over the world having this because we do pray for you. We pray over this book throughout the week, throughout each ministry that meets here we, at home. And we just, we just pray that everybody, God will fulfill their needs. You ready to pray, Bob? All right, hold my hand. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come together to lay our hands upon this book, to pray over these people, Lord. We know that you know what they need and that you'll fulfill each and every need that, of, um, that is here. We ask that you'll lay your hands upon Pastor Woody, that you'll uh, fill him with the Spirit, Lord, to deliver the message that you have given him. We ask that you'll lay your hands upon our offerings and our uh, tithes, Lord, that we'll be able to use it to do the things you want us to do. Please be with each and every church in the community, Lord. Lay your hands upon the pastors who are preaching your word. Be with the pastors who are not teaching your word and just direct them in the direction to teach what you have, taught, what you have told us to teach, Lord. And we ask that you'll be with the community, all of the, the parents, the kids, and all the people around here, that you will lay your hands upon them and deliver them from any issues they may have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Good morning, Rockin' Country Church. Well, sure glad everybody's here today. And man, thanks for that praise. Woo, that was awesome. We love that. That's good stuff. Amen, amen. So again, if, uh, if you want to support the ministry, there, we have our love offering basket there. And then also they have uh, some uh, items outside that uh, you're welcome to give a donation for. Uh, Terry's already hit my wallet, so... Uh, Anyway, if, uh, if you guys uh, would, it didn't take long at all, let me tell you. But uh, anyway, if you want to support their ministry, that's kind of how they do it, all right? It's uh, by uh, having those items out there. And then, of course, they uh, accept the love offerings and such. A couple of things that, uh, that hit me as I was sitting there praising the Lord with, uh, with uh, our folks is that uh, over in Romans 1, uh, it says that, Man is without excuse, for God has made himself known to all of creation. So man is without excuse. So when she was talking about the, I believe it's the Messiah tribe, is that how you say it? Or Masani? Masai. Masai or something like that. Uh, it's close enough, close enough. And, and their response was, their response was, the only way we would know God is if he showed himself to us. That's right out of Scripture. These guys have never picked up a Bible. And that's right out of Scripture. Tell me God doesn't make himself known. He does. And I want you to, as we teach today, or as we learn today, I want you to, to you, you'll find that. Uh, because it's in our teaching for today. That, that very thing is God wanted to make himself known to the world. So, I mean, the way God puts stuff together is just amazing to me sometimes. But uh, that's what he does. You know, we should not be amazed by our God. Why? Because he is an amazing God. All right? And, and nothing should surprise us because he is an amazing God. And so when things happen in our lives that we go, oh, wow, that's amazing. No, that's an amazing God. Always remember that, okay? Things don't just happen. God directs everything that happens. Now, we say, well, why in the world does the bad things have to happen? Well, to put it really plain and simple is, if there were no bad things, you would not know what good things are. You wouldn't know what good things are. So there is evil in our fallen world, and we just have to learn to deal with it and accept it, but still know that God can use all things for the good. And that's in our scripture today, okay? God will glorify himself. He will because he loves you and he loves me. You talk about your son and your daughter. I don't know why God saved me. But then again, I do know why God saved me because he loved me. That's how simple it is. And God can save you too. Why? Not because you're special. Just because he loves you. 
That's how simple it is. We try to make it hard sometimes. We try to, oh, it can't be that simple. This is a simple message. God loves you. God loves you. Oh, but I'm not perfect. But no one else is either. And God still loves you. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because he's an awesome God. That's why. That's why. We have some boys today, so we're going to have children's church. So let's pray that up. We'll get on with our teaching. Our uh, scripture for today is uh, John 17, 12 through 26. We're going to finish up the true Lord's Prayer. We called uh, over in Matthew and, and Luke, we call what we, we know as the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if you look at that and study that, Jesus, Jesus actually tells his disciples, this is how you should pray. Not what you should pray. This is how you should pray. And you have to break that down and study it and understand why God is saying each and every line that is in that. And I've taught on that before. And, and it is, we, first and foremost, our Father who art in heaven. We honor God for who he is. And then we go on down the line, all right? But we want to, we're studying and we want to continue studying and finish today the true Lord's Prayer. Which is chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. And the true Lord's Prayer is Jesus praying for himself. Jesus praying for his disciples, his apostles, the 11 that he sent. We went over most of that last week. We're going to finish it up starting in verse 12 today. And then Jesus praying for me and for you. Jesus prayed for you over 2,000 years ago. God knew you before you were knitted in your mother's womb. And God has prayed for you before the beginning of time. Before anything else was, Jesus prayed for you. He knew you. And as the man Jesus, he prayed for you and me. Chapter 17, and we're going to finish up the Lord's Prayer today. All right, with that though, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we will dismiss our kiddos. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We ask you, Lord, to open up our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits to receive your word today, Lord. Let it manifest itself in us so that we may carry the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel of our Lord and Savior, to, uh, throughout the world. This is what you have called us to do, Lord. And the only way that we can do that is to understand it and receive the message that you have for us. So I ask the Holy Spirit to touch each and every, all of our hearts and open it up, Lord, to receive your glorious word today. Father, be with uh, Miss Terry and whomever else is helping the kids or being with the kids today, that their hearts may be opened up to your word as well, and they may learn and come to a better understanding, as we will, of the love that you have for each of us through Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. So let's dismiss the kiddos. Now that's our scripture for today over in the Gospel of John. Chapter 17. And we're going to, I'm going to share with you real quickly. I know some of you are thinking, yeah, quickly. Nothing's quick about you. <laughs> I'm going to share with you just real quickly where Jesus prays for his disciples, which is verses 6 through 11. And then we're going to pick it back because we, we studied that last week. And we also uh, studied the uh, 17, 1 through 5 the week before. So today we're going to, uh, I'm going to re just quickly review that because one leads to the next. All right. So reading the word of God, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. To the men. This is his 12 Apostles, We know one, and we're going to see it in just a little bit. We know that one of them uh, betrayed him. So it's actually to the 11 now, all right? The 11 apostles. It's not all the people of the world. It's the 11 apostles. He is praying for them. <clears throat> They're yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word, which it means simply they have believed. And whenever it says they, I have manifested, it simply means that he has made known to them. He has made known to them. Verse 7. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them. They have believed. They have truly received it and understood it and believed it. 
and I and have known surely that I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. See, he is not praying for the entire world. He is praying for these particular men. I have prayed for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now that I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Now what Jesus is praying for right here, he is praying for those disciples. He is not praying for the whole world. He is, because this is a lost world that we're in, and God does love the entire world. He wants every person to be saved. Scripture tells us that clearly. However, not all will accept Jesus Christ. So Jesus came to the earth to save the lost children of Israel. So he came to these 12, 12, now 11 disciples, in order to give them a message to carry out throughout the whole world. Now, most of us realize and most of us think, oh, well, Jesus came to save us because we're all sinners, right? No, Jesus came to save the lost children of Israel. That's why Jesus came. He clearly says that. However, because the lost children of Israel would not accept Jesus Christ as the, as the Messiah, therefore God allows us, the Jew, Gentile, Greek, to come, become a part of the Jewish family. He allows us in. God came to change his, the hearts of his holy people, of his chosen people that he chose. And because of their hard-heartedness, he allows us to come in. The Greek. Now, when it says Greek and Gentile, it simply means the Gentiles are the non believers, which would have been all of us. Because, you know, Romans uh, 5 and 10 tells us we're all born enemies of God. Wow, I don't want to be an enemy of God. Well, you're born an enemy of God, according to scriptures. So there has to be a change in order for you to become a child of God, a friend of God. <clears throat> in the last stanza here, it says, Keep uh, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. And what he is talking about there is the unification, unification of those that believe, those who have accepted Christ. Now, what this leads us to is, is we understand that there's a lot of different denominations out there. There's a lot of different churches out there. There's a lot of different buildings out there. There's a lot of different things, uh, thoughts and, and beliefs and doctrines and all this kind of stuff. But as a true believer, we've got to understand one thing. There is one God. There is one Jesus Christ. There is one Holy Spirit. And there is one church. And that is the body of believers in Christ. So it doesn't matter if you go to this church or that church or wherever or whatever, this, that, and the other. It matters whether or not you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Because that is the church. And when you become a member here at this church, this is exactly what I go over with you. We believe in that church. This is a building. This is a building. You are a congregation that comes and meets and worships the Lord in this building. But you are the church. When you leave this building, you're still the church, or at least you should be, and I hope you are. But see, just like Judas that we're going to see here in just a second, a lot of times when people get out of the church, if you will, then they start getting into the world, and that's where the problems come in. You can follow the world, or you can follow Christ. If you follow the world, the world is full of sin. The wages of sin is death. If you follow Christ, the wages of, of uh, a relationship with Christ is eternal life. So it's your choice. God is not going to make you love him. And God will do everything that he possibly can in order to try to show his love for you so that you will love him in return. He's not going to make you love him. He's not going to force you to do it. 
Because that would not be love. That would be force. But God is going to do everything he possibly can to love you as much as he can so that you will love him in return. So that you will love him in return. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them were lost except the son of perdition that was so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, the son of perdition. First and foremost, what does perdition mean? Perdition means eternal damnation. Eternal damnation or total destruction. Now, does that mean that Judas, whenever he hung himself and then he fell and his innards were exposed or his innards came out, his guts poured out? Does that mean that he just rotted away and was gone? No, it doesn't. Because everyone who dies, everyone who dies, whenever they go to hell, if they're a non-believer, and they will go to hell to await the eternal lake of fire, and whenever they go into the eternal lake of fire, they will have a body that literally fills the pain, agony, and sorrow. Scripture calls it the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. They will experience that for eternity. So it is our job to try to keep people from that future, which does exist. Jesus spoke more of hell than he did of heaven. So we have to do whatever we can to carry on the work of Christ to save the world, if you will. Now, we don't save, only Jesus saves. But we show the example of Christ living in us. God knew exactly what Jesus was going to do. God did not make Judas betray Christ. But he knew that Judas would. Now, a lot of times we call this predestination, and we think that God predestined Judas to, God made Judas hate Jesus. He did not. Because evil came in the world from Adam and Eve, there was evil in Judas' heart. And Judas chose, Judas went to, if you read the scriptures, Judas went to the Pharisees and the priests of the church and said, if you will pay me, this is paraphrased, if you will pay me, I will show you who you need to arrest. He chose to do that. They did not go to him and say, hey, you know, we'll give you some money if you'll do this or that. No, he went to them. And he chose, he made the choice to betray Jesus. Why? Because of the pridefulness in his heart. The self-pride. The self-pride. The same exact thing that causes many people to deny Christ today. Well, I don't need Jesus. I am me. What do I need Jesus for? Jesus has got me. I mean, look, look, how, look how awesome it can be if Jesus would just come to know me. Look how awesome it would be if the world would just say, hey, Woody, man, we're just so glad you're here. You're God's gift to the world. Not hardly. But see, I used to be that guy. I used to be that guy when my best friend came to me and said, let me share God with you. I said, I don't need God. Your pastor said, I don't need God. What do I need God for? I got everything I need. I got plenty of money. I got cars. I got boat. I got a nice house. I got family. I got food. What do I need God for? If God wants you, he's going to get you. Okay? He's going to get you. And I just said a while ago, he can use anything to get you, right? Trust me, he can take away anything to get you too. And it can all go in a flash. In a flash. So why are we going to allow, and we do allow, why are we going to allow God to use our demise or our misfortune or whatever you want to call it? Why are we going to do that? In order for God to use us for his glory, why are we going to allow him to, to take us down to nothing when we should allow ourselves to be used by him for his glory? Just like these folks today that are up here singing for us, leading us in praise and worship. God uses their voices, and your voice was perfect. 
It was great today. Thank you, Lord. But why in the world would we want God to, to take us way down to nothing in order to use us? Why not just let him bring us up to everything he wants us to be and let him use that? Wouldn't that be a whole lot easier? I can attest to you, it will be. So allow him to use you. Because he will, whether you like it or not. And he'll use you however he deems necessary. In verse 13, it says, Now, I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. That they may have my joy fulfilled in them. Not the joy of the world, but Jesus' joy. Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the wor world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, the world still hates us today. Oh, you're one of those Christians. Don't knock on my door. I don't want to hear that stuff. Oh, you're going to preach to me? Oh, you think you're better than me? And the world hates Christians today because the Christians try to be better than them. We've got to understand a sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. And if you've broken one sin, you've broken them all, James 2.10 tells us. So we're all sinners. The only difference is, is that we're sinners forgiven by grace. Now, I say we're sinners forgiven by grace, but we need to understand if you are forgiven by grace, you have no sin. What? But I told my wife a little lie this morning when she asked me about that dress. We have to understand that our sins are covered by the blood. Now, we're not perfect because we have a body and a soul that we have to use and deal with. And it is nowhere near perfect. Matter of fact, it's got a lot of work that needs to be done. At least this one does. Yours is probably pretty perfect, but this one ain't. But we must understand that when we are conjoined, enjoined with Christ in our spirit, our spirit the true us, the real us, is made perfect. Perfect. Sinless, no sin whatsoever. That may be kind of hard to understand or hard to comprehend. But if, remember I said your body and your soul still got a lot of work to be done on. But your spirit, your spirit, the true you, is made sinless. That means you have no sin. That's what uh, the First John tells us. That you are sinless. You have no sin in your spirit. The problem is, is our soul doesn't always listen to our spirit. And our body follows our soul. Our body does not follow our spirit. It follow, follows our soul. And there's a difference between soul and spirit. And your spirit has to guide your soul. But your soul has to listen. And pay attention. And receive the message so that your body will follow. Verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them in the world, keep them from the evil one. If God took all the Christian people out of the world, which he will someday, which he will someday, but what if he took us off? Well, I don't want to face any evil. I want God to take me out. Well, you know what happened? You have to die. Well, if you die... Your work's not finished. You still got a lot of work to do. If, 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 every, if all the Christians were taken out of the world, then who's going to spread the gospel? There's nobody here to spread the gospel. Now, this is going to happen one day. This is called the rapture. It's between chapters 3 and chapters 4 of uh, Revelation. Now, don't go there looking for that. Oh, well, wait a minute. There's nothing between chapter 3 and chapter 4, is there? There's, there's just a blank there. It goes from chapter 3, whatever the last verse is, right into 4. So where does it say that we're going to be raptured out? You have to study the Word. And according to the Word, between chapters 3 and chapter 4, the book of Revelation, after Jesus has talked, finished talking about the churches, the church is raptured out. It's taken out. That comes with studying the Word. 
Well, rapture's not in the Bible. No, it's not. But to be caught up in an instant is. And if you go to the Greek, Latin, etc., you will find that rapture mean, is, uh, rap, I think it's raptura or something like that. And it simply means to be caught up instantaneously, which is in the word. So the rapture is in the Bible, just not R-A-P-T-U-R-E. Did I spell that right, teacher? Okay, thank you. I hope so. So we have to understand that at some point in time, God is going to take us out of the world. But if he took us all out of the world right now, hey, Jesus is coming back, right? But before that, there's a seven-year tribulation period that Jesus himself says over more than once, it is the worst time that the world shall ever see. And you know what? I'm not ready for my grandkids and my great-grandkids and my kids and my friends who don't know the Lord. I'm not ready for them to suffer through that. And they will. And I hope you're not either. And if you're not, then it is your calling to try to spread the gospel so that they will become a part of the church. I don't mean a building. I mean the body of Christ, the body of believers, as Jesus describes the church. Because if they're not, oh, but my... My, uh, my, my aunt and my uncle, they're just, they're just really, really good people. They don't really believe in God and Jesus and all that stuff, but they're really, really good people. They're going to be left behind. Oh, but, you know, I've been trying years to get my husband to believe, to become a believer. I've been a believer since I was a kid in school, and, and I grew up in church and on and on. But my husband just, he just doesn't receive all, that was me, he just doesn't receive all that stuff. You know, it's, it sounds like too far-fetched. He will be left, left behind. Scripture tells us there will be two at the grinding stone. One will be left and one will be gone there are two sleeping in the bed one will be left one will be gone I hope I'm not on an airplane and my pilot is a believer when it happens actually I'll be gone as well why because I truly know I am saved now I don't understand it all and, and some of it is over my head but as the song said, he said it, so I believe it. And that's it. That's how I stand on my faith. That's why I study the Bible over and over and over and over and over. Because I don't believe, I don't understand it all, but I believe it all. You can't take out a part you don't like. It is the word of God. In verse 15, he says, do, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Why? Because evil is abounds. Over in uh, Peter, it tells us that the Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to destroy. We have to be very, very careful because we know that Satan will attack us every moment, every chance that he possibly gets. Verse 16, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Only by knowing Christ on a personal level, thus knowing his word, can we trust and believe. And God's promises to his son are available to us as well. If God glorifies Jesus by bringing him back to his right hand and seating Jesus on his throne, as his word says, God will also glorify the 11 and also glorify us who believe. John three sixteen. we all know it. For God so loved the world that whomever, whoever, receives Christ will receive eternal life whoever believes in Jesus will receive eternal life but you have to truly believe in your heart not just oh I believe yeah yeah sure I'm a believer because my wife told me to be a believer so I'm a believer my parents told me to be a believer so I'm a believer my parents were church people, great people. You were talking about your, parents, your mom and dad and, and how awesome they were. And, of course, she's a believer. And, uh, but, but their son went astray. Why would that happen? Because he has a choice. 
The daughter went astray. Why? Because she has a choice. It is your choice to be a believer or not. Nobody can make you believe. As with his disciples, he said in verse 15, I do not pray that you be taken out of the world. Again, if he took everybody else out or all the Christians out, who would be the preachers? Who would share the gospel with the, the people who are still here? A non-believer is not going to share it. Oh, no, I don't believe that stuff either. No, so we have to stay in the world until our time is up. But when our time, when my time is up, guess what? It's going to be William's turn. Or it's going to be Chris's turn. Or it's going to be uh, uh, John, Johnny's turn. It's somebody else's turn. But the message has to go on. It has to be carried on and on and on and on. And ladies, I don't mean to leave you out. Kathy, man, in the 11 years or whatever it's been that I've known you, it's been like night and day. But see, that's what God does. God changes you. I don't change you. God changes you. And you become more and more, as Scripture says, more and more as he is. Which means God looks at you and goes, wow. I don't see Woody anymore. I just see Jesus in Woody. Thank God. Now, Johnny, we got some things we need to discuss, so we're not quite there yet. Bro. No, I'm kidding with you. God, God sees Jesus in you all the time. We have to understand that we are, we are immortal until God is, uh, says our time is up. And until that time comes, we have a mission. We have a ministry. We have a purpose for our lives. A purpose. God created you for his good pleasure. Not for you. Not for your wife, not for your husband. He created you for his good pleasure. And he has a purpose for your life. You have to submit to that purpose. And though we all will face the evil one in some form or fashion from time to time, God's eternal protection is on us. Is on those who believe. And that nothing can snatch us, snatch us out of the hands of God. Let's go over to John chapter 10, a couple of pages back. John chapter 10. I love this verse and this scriptures, or these scriptures, because of my past and because I doubt myself from time to time, which I shouldn't do, but I do. I, I am amazed at why God would accept me knowing who I was. Knowing who I was. But he does. And then furthermore, he will never leave me nor forsake me. As was used in our teaching earlier from our praise team. Okay, let's go to verse 27. Chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, that they shall never perish. Do you see that? Underline that. Highlight that that they shall never perish. Remember whenever Judas, whenever he was the, uh, the one of perdition, that means total destruction? It means eternal damnation? That's perishing. So the opposite of that is to never perish. And this is what Jesus promises us. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Well, how in the world are you going to lose your salvation if Jesus has got a hold of you? Is anybody stronger than God? No. No. Is anybody more powerful than God? Certainly not. Is anybody smarter than God? So there ain't no way, according to what Jesus is promising us here, that somebody's going to be able to snatch you out of, out of uh, uh, God's hand. Now, you may be mucking stalls with me up in, in heaven or tearing out the trash or something, but you get to go to heaven. Jesus says, I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Never shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. Greater than all. All includes all. 
And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. In other words, he's saying, I and the Father are united in this. In other words, that if the Father gives you to Jesus, you receive Jesus, no one can take that away from you. They can't. Because no one's stronger. Now, can you fail? <laughs> yeah. Can you backslide? Yeah. Can you mess up every day? I try not to, but I still do. And by the way, that dress on my wife looks very good. And she looks good. And she makes me look good. And I like it. Back to John 17. We have to understand that God is for us. No one can snatch us out of his hand. And that ought to bring us joy. A joy that is, that is just unfathomable. Because as we read over in John 10 there, the opposite is eternal hell. Total destruction, damnation forever and ever and ever. That's nothing to be joyful about. But here, Jesus gives us his joy. His joy. Verse 17 through 19. Sanctify them by, this is John 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sake, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Now, what does sanctify mean? Sanctify means to be set apart. Now, here's where the Christians kind of mess it up, if you will. Oh, I'm set apart. I'm God's child, so I have to be better than you. Because you're not sanctified. They are sanctified, just the wrong way. They're still set apart. But we must understand, we're not sanctified to be glorious over anybody else. We're sanctified to be better than we were before we were sanctified. How about that? See, don't compare yourself to someone else. Compare yourself to the old you. I know I've come a long way from where I used to be. And I hope you have too. I know many of you have come a long way. And this is what God does. He sanctifies you. He sets you apart. He sets you apart from not, all, from not only all the others of the world, including Christians, but he sets you apart from yourself. From the old you. To be that new creation that he created. That creation that did not exist prior to you receiving Christ. You are a new creation, the word tells us. And so he has set you apart for a specific purpose. In your life. He has set you apart to be different than everybody else, including being different from your old self. Now you're special. Now you're special. You're special in God's eyes because when he looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus in you. Thank God for that. He sets us apart from the world, the fallen world, the Christian world. I'm not the same as, as Brother David here or this Brother David, even though we all have, we have the same name. And some of you are saying, your name's David? I thought it was Woody. <laughs> you know, Gary Till, all right? Gary Till went, I think, about five years. And then all of a sudden he goes, what is your name? And I said, well, my real name is, is David. He goes, I thought it was Woody for five years or whatever it was. It's a length of time. No, I go by Woody because I don't want to be confused. With I want to set myself apart from these two. <laughs> Matter of fact, Marilyn was telling me earlier, she says, whenever they first got together, they set him apart. The David's apart by this is married David. This is single David. 
So see, we have to be set apart. We are set apart. We should be set apart. We should be special in God's eyes. We should be. Not for anybody else's glory, not for honor by men, not for people to go, oh, wow, he's such a man of God. And I hear that a lot, and I, I don't like that term. I'm not trying to put anybody down or anything, but I, I, I don't like people to, to praise men or women, okay? I don't like to hear praise of other people. I want to hear praise of what God did with those other people. I want to give God the glory, not the people. Because I'm just a carpenter. Oh, I'm a realtor too also, just to let you know. <laughs> but we have to understand that God wants to set us apart for his glorious purpose. For his glorious purpose, not for ours, for his. Set us apart, separate us from the rest of the world. While still in the world, residing in his protected hand, as the world around us continues to falter. You see, we need that hand of God on us. We need to be in that palm of that hand. David said a while ago, this David, married David, he said a while ago, he said, we need to spread the gospel and in, 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 in do our ministries in purpose. Well, we need to do it also with purpose. And that with purpose is to glorify God by what he's done in our lives. Okay, not to glorify yourself. Because I know where I came from and I know what I was, but I don't look back, as Paul tells us, I don't look back remembering all the, the stuff. I look back and see how far I've come. And then I look to the future to see how far I can go. I don't judge myself. I don't criticize myself. I just let God judge me and let God guide and direct me. Do I do it perfectly? No. Is anybody going to do it perfectly? No. And if you think you are, you're wrong. However, you put, let God put you in the palm of his hand. Man, he will open doors like you cannot imagine. Remember I told, you, told the church this is our year? We got some more things coming. We got some more things coming, trust me. This is our year. So we must understand the world is not going to accept us on our merits. The world is going to accept us by what they see God doing in our lives. And if you try to do it on your own, you will fail and falter, just like the world has done. But if you allow God, allow God. What do you mean, allow God? Yes, you have to submit to the Him. You have to submit to, his, to what He wants for your life. You have to submit to receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Do you realize that you're not going to hear the voice of God, the voice of the true God? You cannot hear the voice of the true God unless you have the true God in your heart. A lot of us hear voices, and that could be a bad thing. But you're not going to hear the true voice of God unless you have God. And the only way to have God, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. John 14 and 6. You have to have Christ. And another way to express it would be simply as this. He will never leave us nor forsake us. God has us in the palm of his hands, and that's where we want to be. Those apostles that will face the troubles, every one of them faced troubles. Every one of them, with the exception of John, was murdered and, and martyred. Do you know that? Every one of them died by murder or martyrdom, except for John. John was put on the island of Patmos to live out the rest of his life. He wrote the book of Revelation in about 95, 96. And I guarantee you, John died on that island. And it was pretty much a desolate island with a little bitty cave, and that's about it, so I understand. And he was put on that island for one reason, for preaching the gospel and not refusing to stop. That's the reason he was put on the island. 
What? Preaching the gospel of Christ. Do you know Jesus? Oh, well, you're going to put me in jail now for asking somebody if they know Jesus? He was put in jail. He's the only one out of the apostles, the first apostles, the only apostles. He was the only one that died, as we believe, a natural death. And he was put in prison, if you will, because he preached the gospel. That's it. Sad story, eh? So in our text, we see the apostles of Christ did not live a glorious, prosperous life, sit back in their chair and rest and relax. Isn't that what we're supposed to get? Everything's supposed to be just great whenever we become Christians, right? Oh, yeah, life's easy now. Jesus says, hey, enjoy life. No problems. You forget Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's got all these little cronies that he sends out. And all these little cronies try to entice us and tempt us to do evil and, and to involve ourselves into evil. And you know what? Many of us submit to it. Many of us give in to it. Only by letting Christ hold you in the palm of his hand are you able to, to overpower Satan. Satan has no power over you whatsoever. He's a punk. He has no power over you unless you allow it. You have to allow it. Oh, but he's after me today. So what? In the name of Jesus, Satan, be gone from me. He's gone. That's it. It's no big deal. He's a punk. He's already lost a battle. He's lost a war. But you have to stand your ground. We're not promised an easy life. Matter of fact, Jesus says, in the world there are troubles and you shall have them. You shall have them. Jesus said, the world will hate you. The world will hate you because it first hated me. That's in John 15, 18. The world will hate you. Well, I don't want the world to hate me. I've hated myself long enough. Now it's time to love myself. And I know this sounds kind of quirky maybe, but I do love myself. I do. And I don't sit in the mirror and go, oh, you're God. Man, you're awesome. I don't do that. But you see, I do look in the mirror and, and I see the same thing that God sees. I, do, I, can, I look in the mirror and I refuse. I know God has a sense of humor because when I see myself in the mirror, I know, all right? But, but I look in the mirror and I say, man, that's somebody that Jesus died for. That's somebody that God loves. And if God loves them, I should too. I never look in my mirror and say, you're horrible. You're terrible. You're not worth it. Because Jesus died for me. He said I was worth it. And I believe him. He spoke it and it's true. And I believe it. I like that. He spoke it and I believe it. That's pretty easy. And God died for you. Just as much as he died for me. He loves you just as much as he loves me. We also know that his apostles were set on thrones. His apostles were set on thrones in heaven. Jesus told him that. In Matthew 19, 28, he says, And you shall rule over the tribes of Israel on thrones. Now, what is promised to the apostles is promised to us. What is promised to Jesus is promised to us. I don't know that I'll get a throne, but I get to get in heaven. And that's just as important. I don't think I could sit around on a throne. I'm not a sit around type person. But he took his, he told his apostles, you will sit on thrones and rule. But then he tells us, guess what? He tells us we shall also rule. Oh, good. I get to be boss. But he says over in uh, 2 Timothy 2 and 12, he says, we shall reign someday with Christ. We shall reign. Now, a lot of people may say, oh, good. I get a, a crown and I'll probably get a scepter and, you know, I'll probably get a nice big chair. I can sit in and say, thou shalt do this and this and this and this. 
that's not how you're going to reign. You know how you're going to reign? You're going to be up here instead of there. Now, when I say you're going to be up here, I don't mean you're going to be in this pulpit, but I mean you're going to be trying to share the gospel of Jesus with other people. That's what you're going to do. That's your job. Your job is to express, is, is, to, is to share, is to love other people with the love that is in you, which is Christ. That's what you're going to do. That's how you're going to reign. You're going to say, no, friend, that's not the right thing to do. I love the WWJD, what would Jesus do? Yeah, you say, hey, what would Jesus do in this situation? Would he hate that person? Would he, would he try to get back at that person? Would he say nasty things about that person? No. What would he do? He would pray for that person. Jesus says, pray for your enemies. Feed your enemies. Nourish your enemies. Take care of your enemies. Give your enemies a drink of water. He doesn't say destroy them. That's God's job. Let God be God. Our message to the world is Jesus saves. Jesus saves, not us. Jesus saves. And if saved, God the Father will glorify us during our life on the earth. God will glorify us on this earth. He's already, and don't think I, I, I please, and I think you all understand this perfectly well. I, I don't, I'm not any special. I use this Wednesday night talking about me and Thomas back there, my brother Thomas. Uh, there's no difference in, uh, as far as God is concerned between me and him. We're the exact same person. Thomas does a ton of stuff for this church that nobody even knows about. Everybody knows me because I'm up here every Sunday. But God doesn't, God doesn't see me any more important than he sees Thomas. Thomas is just as important to God as I am. But God has glorified me on this life, in this life, doing what I do. God glorifies Thomas in his life doing what he does. God will glorify you in your life doing what you do, whatever that happens to be, such as leading praise and worship. Whatever God calls you to do, that's what you need to do, and he will glorify you, and that's how he glorifies you. Not for you. He's not trying to make you glorified as far as, oh, look at me. I'm such a, you know, awesome person doing this and that and the other. No, you glorify him. Uh, he's glorifying himself through you. He uses you to be glorified. Because guaranteed, I don't know how in the world I would, I would have never have done what I do. But God, there's no way I could do this except God. Because God has me in his hand and he has me for his purpose and I submit to his purpose. And you need to do the same thing, whatever it happens to be. God loves you and wants to use you for his glory. And he will glorify you by using you productively for his kingdom. We didn't get the, uh, the powers that the apostles got where they could walk around and we talked about this last week and touch and heal people. We didn't get the, the power that the Holy Spirit bring, brought to the apostles to, to chase out evil spirits. This is all over Mark 16. We didn't give uh, uh, the power to do signs and wonders and miracles like they did. But we were given power to raise people from the dead. What? Yeah. Not physically, spiritually. Spiritually. If it was physically, there would not be a hospital. There would not be a hospital. These people who say, oh, yes, I can touch him, you know, and we've seen miracle healings, but understand, it is God working through those people that heal people. It is not the people. If it is that person, then I want that person to go to St. Jude's and heal every child that is in there and close St. Jude down. It won't happen. I want that guy to go out here to a graveyard where my mother is and say, Ann Harvey, come out of the grave. It ain't going to happen. Because God did not give us those powers, but he gave us the power to raise the spiritually dead into spiritual life, eternal spiritual life, by simply sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would you not do that? Why would you not do that? That's how you glorify God. You raise dead people. Ooh. 
I see dead people. You know what? According to Scripture, we were all dead. So you know what? I see dead people that are now alive and alive in Christ. We must understand this. We must. God has given us the power to carry on his ministry, to bring peace, comfort, and salvation to all who will receive Jesus. To all who will receive Jesus. God's word is true. We can look at it like food. We can look at God's word like food. Paul tells us you need milk. You need milk. As baby Christians, we need milk. The same milk that we needed as babies from our mothers that would nourish us and give us all the nutrients that we needed in order to continue uh, growing into an adult human being. We need, we need that milk. But then, as adult Christians, it is now time to receive the meat. To re receive the meat. Not just the, the surface words and the surface uh, meanings that we see in Scripture and that we all know, but the meat of the word. And that's the purpose that I'm trying to get through to you today is the meat of the word is that God loves you and he has a plan for you. It's not just for you to come to church. It's not for just you to come into this building. It's for you to go out of this building and share Jesus with the world. We're not going to finish today. We're going to finish next week. We must understand God's word is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help me God. All right? We can look at, at, at it like food, spiritual food. We need that spiritual food in order to start developing us, in order to start growing us. And then later on, we need to start getting the meat, the meat the solid meat of God's word. Let's look at it this way. We're going to have lunch today somewhere. I guarantee it. Okay? So we're going to go have lunch today. Well, I'm going to say that we're going to go and eat uh, Mexican food because I love Mexican food. All right? We're going to go eat Mexican food. Now, I can take that tortilla, if you will, and I can put it in my mouth, and I can chew on it, and I can chew on it, and I can chew on it, and I can chew on it. And I can probably chew on it all day long. And it tastes good. But it does nothing for my body unless I take it internally. It's the same with the Word of God. You can chew on the Word all day long. You can read the Bible over and over and over and over. But until you take it inside, until you eternally take it and receive it, it provides absolutely no nutrition to your spirit. You have to absorb it. And see, that's the difference between receiving the meat of the Word and receiving the milk of the Word. You have to take it in eternally. It has to become real in your life. It has to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your life. If Jesus said, don't steal, don't steal. Oh, well, it's okay to steal a little bit of something from work. No, it's not. See, that's milk. Jesus said, don't steal. So we're not, oh, I think it's even one of the commandments, right? Yeah, I believe it's about number seven, number eight. Do not steal. Thou shalt not steal. But it's okay if I steal a little thing. No, it's not. See, that's the difference between having milk and having the word. The word simply says, do not steal. So you don't take that pen or that paper clip or whatever, piece of paper. I tell my guys who work for me, if you find a penny on the floor, then you put it on the counter. Because that penny belongs to somebody else who either has this house, lives in this house, owns this house, whatever. It is not yours. You put it a penny. Oh, a penny's no big deal. A penny's the same as a million dollars. If it's a sin, it's a sin. Doesn't matter whether it's a little bitty sin or a big sin. It's still a sin. A penny is a penny just as much as it's a million dollars. Doesn't make a difference. Found a diamond earring and a, a lady lost years ago. Found it in her house. It was up in a cabinet 
I don't know if you know what face frame is, but on the face frame of the cabinet, there's a little pocket that sits right behind the door frame, face frame. And there was a diamond earring laying right there. We, of course, were doing, redoing our kitchen, and we went to the cabinets, and boy, out pops this earring. And I took this diamond earring, and because this is their lake house, it's not their house they live in. I took this diamond earring, and I put it in the bathroom, in the medicine cabinet, in a little bottle, to where it couldn't get lost again. And then I sent her a text, and I said, your diamond earring is blah, 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 blah. She goes, I've been looking for that diamond earring for years. For years. I don't know how much it's worth, but it's probably worth more than what my job was. But to me... It was worth nothing because it didn't belong to me. It belonged to her. To her, it meant the world. To her, it meant the world. So you have to understand what is right is right. What is wrong is wrong. There's no in-between. What is unrighteous is unrighteous. What is righteous is righteous. What is unholy is unholy. What is holy is holy. It's just that simple. What would Jesus do? Jesus' life was precious. It was holy. It was more valuable than anything else in the whole wide world, in the whole universe. One drop of his blood was more valuable, as they said in the song. One drop of his blood was more valuable than all the gold and the silver in the whole world, all the diamonds, all the emeralds. It is the most precious thing. And he gave that blood for you and I on the cross. He shed that blood for you and I on the cross. How precious is Jesus' blood? One minute drop of his blood can wash away all the sins of the world. Can cover all the sins of the world. That's how precious Jesus is to the Father. You're just as precious in God's eyes. God loves you so much. He loves you so much that he gave his one and only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but receive eternal life. That's how simple it is. How difficult is that to understand? How difficult is that to receive? How difficult is that to believe? How difficult is that to believe? You see, you have to believe. You can't just say, oh, I know all about that stuff. I heard the preacher one time tell me that Jesus saves. He died on the cross so that I could, my sins would be covered and, and I could be saved. I understand all that stuff. No, what you need to understand is, is one minute, minute particle drop, however you want to call it, microscopic piece of his blood is enough to cover all of our sins. All of our sins. You have to believe that. And then once you believe that, that Jesus died, he became the atoning sacrifice. He paid the price for your sins that we deserve to pay for, that we should have to pay for. He paid for it with his precious, precious blood. And we want to be glorified because we're a Christian no, we want to glorify him in worship and praise because he died for me and he died for you. But he died for those who did not love him. In John 1, I think it's verse 4 and 5, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, he says, He came unto his own, and his own would not receive him. So my question to you today is, is will you receive him? Jesus has come to you through the word. And will you receive him as Lord and Savior? Let's pray. Father God, if there's anyone here today who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Father, I, I don't know what else to do. I've tried to express the fact of how important it was for, for us to realize how much we mean to God. 
And the way that we show our love for him is to receive your son and to believe in your son. If there's anybody here today who has not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, Jesus may, may uh, sound his trumpet today. He could sound his trumpet tonight. There's nothing else waiting for, to hold Jesus back from sounding that trumpet and calling his church home. And I want you to be a part of that church, the believers in Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to coerce you. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm not trying to, to judge you into it or even convict you or condemn you into it. I am trying to encourage you to simply believe because he said it. He said, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive eternal life. So I'm asking you today, and you have to mean it in your heart, do you believe in Jesus? If you have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, we're going to do the sinner's prayer, what we call the sinner's prayer. It's very simple. But again, you must confess it with your mouth. You must bring it out. God wants you to speak it out. You can either speak it out softly or you can shout it to the, to the treetops if you want to. But you need to, Jesus wants you to hear yourself say it and mean it. Just say, dear Jesus, sweet Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins that I have committed over the years. I've heard the word of God today. I've heard your word. I've heard you. And I know you shed your blood for me on the cross. Would you please take a drop of that blood, cover my sins, allow me to come into your kingdom and be a child of the Most High God. Jesus, today I receive you by faith as Lord and Savior of my life. And I want to just say thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.